Thank you, and thank you for the invitation uh, as well. It's lovely to, to be here. Um, I, have a, I have some images you will be able to see, but unfortunately the first one isn't one of them. I think you, you probably can't see that at all, can you? Can, can you see it in that version? No. Well, I'll show you at the very end, but the, the project which I ran with a colleague who's in marine biology in UCC called Rob McAllen, um, and anyone who spends any time around Loch Ine might know him because he does a lot of the UCC scientific work there on the, on the loch. Um, and we put together a website, and it's just called Deep Maps Cork. If you Google it, Deep Maps Cork, it'll, it'll come up, and you'll be able to see this lovely image, <laughs> which is from the King's Topographical Collection, the collection of images that George III had made for him um, of you know, beautiful sites from all around the empire. And this is um, an image of Bantry Bay from that collection. Um, and it doesn't show the town of Bantry as we now know it, but what was then the Cromwellian settlement outside of Bantry. Uh, it was called Newtown. There's still a Newtown house outside Bantry. Some of you might, might know it. Um, and it was a kind of a planned settlement, but it's, an, it's, a, <laughs> here I am, it's a very beautiful image, um, almost kind of um, like as if you're looking at the coast under, a, under glass or under a globe, very much framed for us to look at with the view from Bantry over, to, over Widdy, over to the Bera Peninsula. Um, and, and one of the things that's very noticeable um, in the map, if you could see it, <laughs> is um, the number of uh, ships with the Union flag that are in the bay. And there's a kind of, like, it's almost like a prospectus for would be planters. They're hoping people will come to Bantry. And so there's different types of housing shown, as if you could move into this kind of house or that kind of house, depending on how much money you have. So it's very much um, making the coast available and ready. And, you know, please come here, bring your money. And um, it's post. Uh, it's just in the period after Cromwell, so it's when the, the face of the country was being changed so much, uh, so many people were dispossessed and the new owners were coming into Ireland. And, and so my talk today really is about the role of the coast in that history, but also to think about coasts on their own terms a bit more. Um, we have so much, so many different ways in Irish history of talking about the battle for land, uh, or sometimes we say soil, just to get us really riled up. Um, and, uh, but that is, th th that's always metaphorical, or it's almost always metaphorical, uh, whereas in fact the talk this afternoon is to think a little bit more about lakes and bogs and bays and harbours and inlets um, on their own terms as kind of um, aspects of actually now an imperiled natural environment that needs our care and attention. And so one of the reasons we did this project was to, to see what kind of deepening perspectives on the in natural environment help us to kind of maybe change behavior or think differently about, about our coast. And it proves particularly difficult in the case of the, uh, of the coast, I think. Uh, so we're currently witnessing a very rich moment in scholarship, in history, in literature, all across the humanities of people thinking more about the environment. You can imagine why, of course. Um, and the, um, a lot of people are using this term, the Anthropocene now. Some of you might have come across it before, which is the idea that we can date a new period, uh, the date of, of, of significant um, human impact on the planet as we now live it. And people disagree about the date. And actually, for a literary scholar such as myself, there's something quite um, interesting in the vagueness of the language. People say around and about the period of the Industrial Revolution, maybe, or um, uh, maybe around 1800. Um, and in that kind of vagueness, actually, one of the things you see is where um, more ambiguous practices such as poetry or the visual arts can actually help us chart the history. And I'll come back to that at the end of the, at the, end of the, of the talk. Uh, so the, what I'm going to sort of take you through basically is some of the ways in which the West Cork coastline has been known over history. Um, what kind of stories have we been told or have we told ourselves about the West Cork, um, uh, the coast of West Cork, and how can that um, help us think more about how to tell an environmental story about the coast? And we can't put the political story to one side. How could we? You know, there's, we just heard a fantastic example 
of a, such a like dynamic account of a fantastic political moment um, in, the, in the last talk about Daniel O'Connell's monster meeting in Skibbereen. But what have we thought more about, you know, the hill on which it met and the history of that hill and the, the kind of natural formations, I suppose. So that's, the, that's my topic. Um, so... I have, um, I, I mentioned the, the Bantry Bay image and another image that you can't see properly. They, they get much better after this, I promise. This is, this is the last one. It's, it's partly because of the age of these images. This one is from 1588, uh, held again in the British Library. Often these, it, these um, are resources that are not held in Irish collections, partly because of the, the, from the, this period in the 16th century which is a coloured chart of the southwest, now you can maybe see it slightly better on that, um, of, of Ireland from, um, uh, from the Shannon uh, to Cork. Uh, and that has a kind of a unit, if you like. It's not like talking about um, the north of Ireland or the south of Ireland, but the idea of a kind of a natural unit from the Shannon, say from the mouth of the Shannon to the mouth of the Lee, uh, so much of our kind of island history has been made along that that, that line, if you like, of, of coastland. And yet, if we go here to 1588, so little was known about it. And yet, it was important to map it. Uh, and on a map, this is just a contemporary map overlaid on the older one. Uh, but the, the cartographers are drawing lines to, sh to allow people to navigate along the coasts, basically, how to get from harbour to harbour. And still, so much of our knowledge about the coast goes back to imperial sources, uh, especially, of course, the admiralty maps. Uh, which um, some of you might even have copies of them at home, uh, and we've continued to update and modernise those maps, much like with the Ordnance Survey itself. Um, and this is um, one of the early discussions of um, the southwest of Ireland and the coastline and what the coastline was like. I won't read it all to you, but I, I enjoy this um, account very much because of it both because it seems to find the southwest of Ireland to be a kind of a problem, if you like. And it's from a book called The Natural History of Ireland, the first, usually described as the first natural history of Ireland, um, and written by a man who travelled to Ireland with Cromwell as a physician. Um, he died very shortly afterwards, but his brother was also with Cromwell, and they were making notes on Irish natural history, and they were agreeing, uh, they were putting together a lot of, of information which they subsequently published. They were interested in the new science of natural observation, uh, empirical science, and, and so on. Um, and so they start with the shape, the shape and the bigness of Ireland. Uh, long way square, but not fully, uh, for to say nothing of several uh, corners and forelands, which run out a great way into the sea, nor of diverse great bays and inlets, which the sea maketh here and there, in the three other parts of this island. Uh, the fourth part, called Munster, doth greatly alter that figure. So you can, if you imagine an Ireland that is roughly square, Boat is telling people who, in England who may not have been to Ireland in this period. And again, this is uh, the historian Toby Bernard has described this as a kind of prospectus for would-be settlers, basically, to come to Ireland. So they should know about the shape of the island. So Ireland, you could think about it as square. It wasn't for this problematic fourth part called Munster which doth greatly alter that figure. Uh, for instead of stretching itself first from the north to the south and then from the south to the west, it runneth altogether sloping uh, from the north east to the southwest. And there besides, it stretches itself much further into the sea with its western shores than any other part of Ireland on the same west side. Why is it doing that? Um, uh, and one of the things I like about this account is it does give a sort of an agency to the island uh, and, and to its distinctive topography and this kind of stretching, which we all know so well from maps, that's stretching down into the um, thing. And, and if you compare this to a modern geological map of Ireland, in fact, it's very accurate in terms of the geological difference of the southwest and, and the, the stretching down of the sandstone and the limestone into the, into the sea. Uh, so boat is kind of... Um, uh, imagining Ireland, I suppose, is an object of improvement. Land, more can be done. There's, you know, diverse bays and harbours. Everything can be tapped. Um, everything can be improved, extracted. Uh, you could, in contemporary terms, describe it as a manual for resource extraction. Uh, but, or you could also think about it um, in, in the kind of political terms in which it's usually uh, discussed. 
Uh, and it goes along then with the kind of a whole set of other similar accounts and books for, into the 17th and the uh, 18th century, uh, where we have um, similar discussions about the um, uh, the. The, the, the kind of the landscape and the natural history of Ireland. So um, many of you will have come across Charles Smith's Ancient and Present State of the City and County of Cork, 1750, um, reprinted endlessly all through the um, 18th and the 19th century, sorry. Um, uh, which talks first about the problem of finding the longitude of Cork. Um, Smith wrote another county history of Kerry as well, and he was part of a group uh, called the Physico-Historical Society who were interested in assembling new and scientifically accurate information about, about Ireland. Um, so requisite that the whole coast of the ocean be first laid down truly, and Smith here is really acknowledging the difficulty of doing um, that, and also saying um, uh, acknowledges a kind of as proverbial that there is more good land and more bad in this county than in any in Ireland. Um, it's another claim to Cork exceptionalism, uh, I'm sure, um, and. Uh, here again, in the same mode, we have Horatio Townsend, um, his statistical survey of Cork from, from 1808, which again comes at, wants to kind of survey, think about what can be improved, what can be changed um, in, in the landscape, but again encounters the kind of um, this, bit, this bit of the southwest that is stretching itself down into the sea, so indented. Uh, again, in contemporary terms, we talk about it as a kind of a fractal coastline. Um, and uh, Townsend says, nature compensates in one way what she denies in the other. In the south and southwest parts of Cork, where the rocky inequality of the ground renders artificial, artificial navigation impracticable, the sea and its numerous indentures give uh, abundant facility of water carriage. So it's the idea that the, um, where travel on land becomes difficult because of the lack of road infrastructure and so on, uh, the sea kind of steps in here. So the sea is, the sea provides, um, but the sea is almost providing too much, Townsend says. Uh, talking about how the proud Atlantic, you know, which for the greater part of the year are dashed against its shores by the force of the prevailing winds. What better topic could we have? Um, this weekend than wind and weather in West Cork. A bulwark, Townsend says, of inferior durability might indeed suffice for the safety of the coast. So the coast could, it's great that the coast is there protecting us and shaping us, but it could be a little bit less rocky and that would still be fine. Um, uh, but such is the depth and turbulence of that vast ocean that none who have seen it raging will be disposed to complain of a superabundant protection. So you get these, this language always of persistence, irregularity, excess, uh, running through the efforts of the improvers all through the 17th and the 18th century to think about the coastline. But at the same time, what they're always doing is recording important uh, aspects of the environment of the coast. And in a sense, um, the very kind of determinedly ideological and political nature of what they want to do, which is remake Irish land for new English owners, um, makes them more attentive to the environment and the coastline and the details of our natural history um, than some other commentators later, maybe in the 19th century, were. Does that make sense? So there's a sort of, these in a way, these books, I think we can think about them as um, resources uh, at a time of, you know, at, at the commons, almost the frontiers of political and environmental history. And we can return to them um, if we can um, look away from some of the things that we find distasteful now, we can still re return to them and find them as resources for our, our present, not least just because of the sheer abundance of, of information as well. Uh, so um, that Talking then about these various attempts to kind of know the coast, uh, these are all obviously coming from a t particular perspective. This is the post-Cromwellian moment, land resettlement and, uh, and, and so on. 
Um, and from about the middle of the 16th century, the Ireland's southwest coast had been kind of inextricably caught up in English um, uh, expansionist ambitions. Uh, David Dixon writes very well about this in his wonderful um, book about um, Cork, um, social and economic history, that once there, you have an expansionist England, particularly with an eye to the West, then the whole southwest coast is just inevitably caught up in these kind of jour imperial journeys. Uh, and of course, the, the history of Cork City itself as a, um, a provisioning ground for the British Navy and so on is so important in this wider, in this wider history. Um, and the language, again, is always that of kind of untapped riches, um, being ripe for exploitation, needing only energy and um, uh, the, uh, the work of the improvers to, to, make, to make all of these resources worthwhile. Uh, so another kind of source, then, we can think, still thinking about external perspectives on the coast, I suppose, um, uh, th there are some... Um, French and other continental sources uh, where, where they give us an account of this um, of the coastline and there's a wonderful French uh, uh, study a uh, book from the 1750s I think Let me just get the date of it um, yeah so uh, first published in 1763 in Paris and translated into English in 1801 uh, as the little sea torch or a true guide for coasting pilots. Um, and Ireland is only one part of this book. Um, uh, but it offers very, very detailed graphic drawings of the coastline. Um, and so, for example, what would the coast of Cape Clear look to you from the sea if you were approaching it? How ought you to um, navigate the reef, as they describe it, of the fastnet? Um, and there's kind of these graphic images, often, often just showing highly abstract images of the coast as like a series of shapes um, that, still, that still work and are often those kinds of same drawings that you find in the Admiralty maps of a kind of a line of the coastline so that you can, um, you can see it. And it's, um, uh, it's so interesting in the, in the French text to see places like, um, there's, a, there's a reference, for example, to Mizenhead. And you think, oh, what's that? And then you say it out loud and you realise, of course, it's Mizenhead. And they have, there's a whole kind of French orthography for writing of the West Cork, West Cork places. Um, and the, um, uh, the, the other kind of source then that becomes important and when we can begin to kind of join, as, as it were, kind of external and internal or more native accounts of the coast um, uh, is the Ordnance Survey itself. So you know the Ordnance Survey office was opened in Dublin in 1824 in the Phoenix Park. Uh, the amazing, uh, learned Gaelic scholar John O'Donovan began the process of travelling around parts of Ireland, recording his wonderful letters and so on as, as he did so. And the, the letters for Cork are a little bit patchy, but one of the things O'Donovan says on a arriving in Cork is, this county, he says, is particularly Irish. And that's the word he uses. He says, especially in the mountains and along the coasts. Uh, and so he sees much prospect for kind of uh, recording Irish um, uh, information about antiquities and so on when, he's, when he gets to Cork. But in fact, it doesn't go very well for him at all, not least because it takes him ages to get anywhere. Um, and the, as I say, the Cork records are patchier than those of, um, of other counties. Um, but at the same time, in those same Ordnance Survey letters, you find Donovan recording aspects of the Cork coastline uh, that are um, uh, not Irish in the sense that he's looking for as an evidence of the original language of the island or the culture or the archaeology and so on. Um, and one of the things he writes about is the um, Nelson Arch at Castle Townsend. Has anyone ever, did anyone ever see that? It doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore except as a kind of... Um, uh, the, the remnant of a rubble of, of a few stones. This is, um, this was myself and some of the researchers on the project going off in search of it um, with some people you might recognise there who very kindly helped us to, um, uh, to find it, including Tom Somerville and his, uh, his, his cousin. Uh, uh, but the, uh, one of the things that Donovan describes in the Ordnance Survey letters is seeing this um, Nelson Arch, as it was described. And famously, Stephen Gwynne wrote about this, 
uh, as a rough stone arch that was set up overlooking the harbour in memory of the day when a swift frigate bringing up from the south put into here and brought to these islands, islands the first news of Trafalgar. Uh, and so the idea is that Castle Townsend knew about Nelson's victory in Trafalgar long before they knew about it in London. And news had to travel from here to, um, uh, to the Admiralty Office to, to let them know about, um, about Trafalgar. Uh, and at the time, the coast was home to thousands of sea fencibles who were guarding the coast during the period of the Napoleonic and the Peninsular Wars, who immediately set to work um, assembling uh, a triumphal arch, which could be seen on entrance to the uh, seen on entrance to the bay, um, and um, uh, was sketched by one of the um, uh, one of the naval officers at the time. And the sketch is in the Crawford Gallery in in Cork, or you can see it again on the deep maps. Uh, on the Deep Maps website. Uh, and that story, uh, and the, the arch then has a wonderful history because it, um, it was subsequently um, uh, destroyed in the 60s after the bombing of Nelson's Pillar. There was a piece in the Irish Examiner the next day saying, and yet a monument to Nelson yet remains uh, in Ireland. <laughs> uh, and some people took it upon themselves to make sure that it didn't remain. Anymore, and it was rebuilt by pe by local people in in Castle Townsend, only to be demolished once again um, in the 80s by, as they told us that day, hooligans with less direct political uh, interest in what it represented. Um, and the last time, many of the stones were actually pushed off the the edge on which it is, so it's it's not possible to kind of reconstruct it um, as it is as it is now. Uh, so so there's a kind of um, uh, complexity to the history of the coast, the ever um, presence of empire. And in the last uh, talk, it was mentioned how many, um, during again that period, especially of the Napoleonic and Peninsular Wars, how many Irish um, men were serving in the army and the navy. I think one figure is probably something like 40% of the non-commissioned men in the army and the navy were Irish born. And many, many of, when it comes to the navy, many, many of those men came from the uh, southwest, uh, and so the um, the coastline then becomes this um, uh, becomes different again in the era when land-based power starts to more kind of emphatically radiate outwards from Dublin in the period after the Act of Union. Um, so even as O'Donovan is complaining that it's difficult to get around West Cork in the 1820s, already many new lines of road are being built. The railway will shortly follow and will be extended further as the century goes on. And in a sense, our history has moved with those land-based routes. It's moved with the roads and the railways um, and have tur has turned away a little bit from the coastline itself and the older ways of navigating around the, the coastline. And I'm suggesting that some of those earlier sources can help us to, uh, to return to that moment. You do have things like as fish, you know, reports on Irish fisheries in the 1830s. Um, and then later, of course, the philanthropic efforts of the Coots family in um, Baltimore and, um, and, and around there to, to set up kind of um, uh, re renew fishing industries after, in the period after the famine. The famine itself as an ecological crisis on an unprecedented scale has also had its impact on our way of being able to kind of understand the environmental history of the coastline and tell, uh, tell, that, uh, tell that story, I guess. Um, so just for what time I have left um, uh, the last uh, little bit of the talk, I want to tell you a little bit more about thinking about um, literary and other kinds of cultural sources for thinking about um, the environment of the, uh, of, of the, of the coast. Um, and focusing um, especially on, on literature, but I start perhaps by thinking a little more about uh, folk, uh, folklore as well as a, as a resource. Um, this is just um, a nearly invisible clipping from the Ducas website. Has anyone ever used that? Ducas.ie, uh, which has the wonderful resources and the holdings of the, the findings of the National Folklore um, uh, a commission from earlier in the last uh, in, in the last century, um, and one of the stories in it, um, you can lose hours of your life, days of your life, exploring different place names in West Cork and thinking about the kinds of stories that were known and told about those places. And often, you what you find are stories. 
that kind of blend environmental and political stories, or they tell one as the other, perhaps, sometimes. Um, so an example is a story about uh, Tim League. And um, one thing we know about Tim League and Clonakilty in particular is um, how significant the silting up of those estuaries was from the middle of the 18th century onwards. And different people recorded, um, uh, especially from about the 1750s. And arguably, the Lisbon earthquake of 1755 also had um, uh, played a part in the, that silting up of the estuaries because of the effect of the, uh, the tsunami effect created by the Lisbon earthquake as it moved um, as it moved along the the Atlantic and made sure made landfall in different places on the on the Irish coast. Um, and in the um, but in the Ducas stories, one of the accounts of um, uh, of the Timolig, uh estuary um, with its very distinctive mud flat environment. It's a special area of conservation now because of the many seabirds and forms of wildlife that it's uh, that it's home to. And there's many many um, uh, wonderful accounts of um, Timolig. Uh, from the going back to the um, uh, going back to the, the literature and the poetry, but in this uh, account, um, one of the respondents, um, a Mr. Clark, I think, uh, told the collector that Timolique Abbey contained some beautiful altar vessels, and when the English soldiers came to burn the abbey, they tried to take away these vessels, but they were trapped by the flames of the burning abbey. Now Timolique Abbey was unroofed and burned in the Cromwellian period. When they could not take them away, the beautiful altar vessels, they threw them into the slob, and the slob opened up and swallowed them. The slob, then, it's slob it comes from the Irish word for mud, meaning that kind of very distinctive, silty mud, estuarine mud that we would all recognize. When they threw them into the slob, and the slob opened and swallowed them, and every year since, the slob has risen higher and higher, so that uh, no boat can go there now. The bell was also thrown in, but the Protestants recovered it, and it is now in the Protestant church in Clonakilty. Um, so it's, it's a, it, it tells, like I say, it tells an environmental story as a kind of a political one, or it makes sense, and the, the story is moving in, in both directions, and a kind of a sensitivity to those kinds of sources, I suppose, is what we need to kind of um, think a little bit more about these uh, very highly distinctive um, marine um, environments that we have all along the, the coastline. And indeed... Um, one of the things we discovered, you can't see that really either, one of the things we discovered was um, when we did the Deep Maps project, we, we made a kind of a digital map of the West Cork coast uh, with different layers that you can turn on and off, basically. So you can click, uh, show me all the areas of special uh, areas of conservation, environmental conservation, or you can just click um, places where there are special stories told about, or you can click places where poems are set or that are described in poems. Uh, or you can put mix up these layers. And if you just turn on the poetry layer and the environmental layer, they map almost exactly onto one another. So it's almost as if uh, places that we what we know are special, sort of in our bones, and the scientists have since told us are special. Uh, Loch Ein near here would be a wonderful example of this. Uh, th that kind of environmental uniqueness was already being precociously registered in um, in po in poetry, for for example, and the map is a nice um, example of that. And yet that poetry doesn't always present itself as a very kind of easy resource to access. You know, if you return to 19th century Irish poetry in English, often what you find are very kind of complex language, um, references that can be obscure to us now, or a kind of terms that we're not um, sure about. And you also find the kind of, often in these writers, the sheer effort of writing in English, the kind of the rhythms and the sounds and the sights of Irish life. And so if you think of the period of the language shift, the late 18th into the 19th century, um, as, as being so kind of, it's such a decisive moment. And that's also when this wonderful body of Irish language, Irish English language, Irish writing starts to emerge. It's really when we date the beginning of English Irish literature from or what we used to call Anglo-Irish literature. Um, so you, you find that kind of effort, and sometimes the effort shows a little bit more, uh, too much in the, in the poetry. So I'm just going to give you an example of this. Um, and this is from a poem called The Reclusive Inchidani. Does anyone know it? 
It's very long. It's, uh, 60 odd stanzas. And it's by um, a young Cork poet called Jeremiah Joseph Callanan, who was born in Ballinhasic in the very early years of the um, 19th century, born in, maybe I think he was born in, 17, in the late 1790s, and who died in Lisbon in 1829. So his life is very tragic and short. Um, and he was a very interesting example of a sort of Maybe, you know, an, an aspiring young Catholic who was looking for the kinds of work one could do in that period. Uh, so he went to Maynooth um, to, uh, to be a seminarian, but couldn't stick it. So he went after that to teach, but that didn't go well either. Uh, he taught in Carlow for a while, and he joined the British Navy, but he only got as far as the Scilly Isles, and he came back to Cork. <laughs> And finally, he became a tutor for a merchant family in Cork and went to Lisbon, but then he died uh, and of, um, uh, of TB. Uh, but some of, in, in some of his writing, we have some of, the, again, the, most, the earliest and most precocious and important efforts to write about the West Cork coast, to find a distinctive language in English, but that also knows the Irish language culture of the place and tries to kind of register it. And again, if you look on the Deep Maps website, one of the things we have are a series of attempts of his to write poems, um, which he called the Songs of the Gascanon. Um, and the Gascanon is a sound uh, between um, Cape Clear and Shirkin, which one has to cross through if you sail from, um, uh, fr from Shirkin towards, out of Baltimore towards, towards Cape Clear. Uh, and it's known to be a very difficult piece of water. And there was a kind of a belief that if one said certain words over it, um, you, and if the words were effective enough, then you would quell the effects of the water. Uh, and um, there were, so Callanan both records other people's attempts to do this and tries to write original songs of the Gasconon um, himself. Uh, but I said I'd tell you a bit more about the, uh, the Inchidani poem. Uh, so in the reclusive Inchidani, one of the things he does is tries to think about the place Inchidani, where it is, what it means, the particular in, uh, where the land meets the sea, the shaping of, the, of, that, of, that, the, of the topography, the way in which the land has made, the sea has made the land. Um, and these are just some lines from the poem. Is this the Atlantic that before me rolls in its eternal freedom round thy shore? Hath its grand march no moral yet for souls? Is there no sound to glory in its roar? Must man alone be abject evermore? Slave, hast thou ever gazed upon that sea? When did the strong wind its wrathful billows bore against the earth? Did not their mission seem to be to lash thee into life, to teach thee to be free? Uh, so full of questions. Is this the Atlantic that before me rolls? Of course it's the Atlantic. How could there be any question about the Atlantic? But it, almost 10 years later, you have Thoreau in, um, in New England uh, at Walden Pond saying, is this Walden I see before me? Do I know you? Do I know you as a body of water? And what more can I know? And how can I know this place? So the uncertainty and the questioning it speaks of a kind of a, a romantic, I suppose, sensitivity and a susceptibility to the specific meanings of landscape. And something in the poem caught the imagination of, of some later readers. Uh, so Yeats, for example, is supposed to have said to somebody when he was coming out of a lecture in, in London, um, uh, where everyone had been talking about where Keats and Shelley lived, in particular, um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the idea of visiting the homes of writers. And Keats, uh, Yeats is supposed to have said, well, I, who never had an interest in where Keats or Shelley lived, long to go to Inch a place called Inchidani, uh, because I read a poem once, uh, he says, a bad poem by Callanan uh, <laughs> ab about that place. So there's a sort of a spark there. Something resonates about the place. Uh, and there's a kind of a line there that can, can, be, can be followed up, I suppose. 
Um, yet that same um, body of water remained um, so much kind of entangled with empire. And then in Callanan's lines that I read out, you can hear those words again, you know, abject slave. Um, another of his poems is about the, uh, a young um, Cork midshipman leaving, leaving Cork Harbour to sail out to, um, the pen to sail to the peninsula for war and the ship is wrecked at Mizzen. Um, and it's the, the kind of the, the conflicted views of the young man who is going to serve um, a country and is that country his own? He's, and it gets his questions, all the time questions. And the um, uncertainty and the ambiguity and yet the powerful identity of, of the coast as a distinct place with its own history always kind of informs those questions and those, those poems. So I'll stop there, I think. Thanks.